started uh, uh, the virtual U of T Grand Rounds. Um, it truly has been phenomenal connecting with everyone. Um, a couple of housekeeping announcements for, for attendees. Please do feel free to ask questions or engage the speakers in the chat box. I will be keeping an eye on that and will be moderating that. So if you have questions for our speakers, please do feel free to type them into the chat box and we will get to as many as we can, either during their talks or possibly at the end during the Q&A session. Um, with that said, I'd like to um, invite John to introduce our first speakers. Yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, I want to lead off, uh, as we mentioned um, previously, we were going to spend a few minutes before we start into our didactic teaching on uh, wellness during this uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, Dr. Rada Coley, who's our uh, lead on faculty development, has invited uh, Dr. Bruno Lichter to uh, speak with us today on some issues regarding um, staying well during this period. So welcome to you both. Thank you, John. Um, and again, thank you to the committee and Sharif for um, allowing us to do these brief wellness rounds. Um, they're very important and we feel that keeping the dialogue going is important um, so that we all know that we're go all going through similar experiences. So Myrna has a Dr. Myrna Lichter, um, who I've known for many years has been in practice for many years and in this sort of phase of her career over the last, how many years have you been doing your vulnerable population work, Myrna? Uh, 10 years, yeah, that's seven past, years actively, yeah. Last decade or so, Myrna has been doing a lot of amazing and inspiring work on vulnerable populations, going into shelters, women's shelters, populations, the homeless, all these vulnerable populations looking at what um, eye care they receive and what eye care they need. It's been very inspirational. In fact, uh, Alan Slomovic the other day, uh, we were talking about Dr. Lichter and he said, you know, she's inspired me so much that every week he now during this crisis or the pandemic, he's been um, going to women's shelters and delivering groceries once a week. And that's just one of many stories of how uh, Myrna has inspired all of us to be aware of vulnerable populations, um, their eye needs for sure, but also um, other needs that they have. Uh, so without going further into um, Myrna's academic history, uh, Myrna's also been very concerned about wellness. And it, this goes back to when I was a resident. Um, I remember she pulled uh, a co uh, one of my co-resident, Dr. Bakshi and I, out of a conference once and took us for... <laughs> Pedicures. Something else and a Manny Petty and said this is also important and checked in with us and how we were doing and she's continued to do that with you know many residents so it's uh, it's very important it's always been important to her so with that I'm going to start asking you some questions Verna on your own experiences in life and how those have carried through to helping you um, now uh, during this pandemic and maintaining sort of a healthy approach so why don't you start with telling us about your own oh. experience so actually, uh, you know, Rad and I had talked about doing a, a, a session on coping with adversity, even before COVID-19. And part of the reason for that is that, you know, I went to the Women Leaders Conference and I looked at all these women and they were spectacular, but all of them seemed to lead these picture perfect lives with perfect families and great career paths. And really did, you know, and I was sitting beside a colleague of mine that I will not mention, who had had some adversity and I said I personally had faced adversity in my life and leadership should, is not confined obviously only to people who have had picture perfect lives and so there were two incidents that I'll mention in my life that have have I hopefully will be um, beneficial to especially one to the very young and maybe later on in a career so the first episode happened very early in my career um, I had finished my fellowship in pathology and I had started a general practice with the aim, of course, to get back into research eventually. And um, I'd had my second child and I said, my children have to learn that, um, that I am a clinician and that my patients are a priority, which would have been great if my second child had not died of crib death at home alone at seven weeks. And so that was extremely difficult and for a long time. And of course, what it made me realize, and maybe the message for young 
especially young female clinicians starting out who are worried, what is the impact of mine having to spend time with my family going to have on my career? The lesson to be learned is, is that your family is a priority and that, they, that you can actually achieve whatever you want, your leadership roles, but you may have to delay it a bit. You may have to make your family priority for a number of years before you can get back to doing what you want. And hopefully we all will be supportive of women who have chosen to take some time off when their family concerns are high so that they can prioritize and, and later return to an active academic role. And the second major incident was of course the death of my husband five years ago. And again, the lesson there was again, how to prioritize. I mean, I was trying to run a practice while my husband was in ICU for five months and my mother-in-law was dying of cancer. And, and again, like, how do you prioritize your time? And one of the things I did not take advantage of, and I wish I had, was the support of my colleagues who probably would have helped me out if I had reached out to them. And my message here is to people of all ages that if you are facing a crisis or if you are in need, that is why your colleagues are here. And I would like to have a shout out to all of us to say that if somebody is in need, that we should that they should feel comfortable either through this platform or another platform reaching out to their colleagues and say hey i need some help right now can you help me out with my practice or can you help me out and and because we are a supportive community so that was the start and then of course you know i've been actively you know involved in in helping homeless patients and, and they've been a great learning experience for me that I mean, the message that none of us are alone is profound, Myrna. And during the current pandemic, have you um, how have you reached out to people, or have you found people? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I I would suggest that um, yeah, of course. You know, I I, I keep in touch with many of my colleagues. I go walking with Hadassah Goldberg you know, once every week or so, and I walk with other people. And I speak to people every day, not to mention patients, but I speak to my colleagues every day and try to keep in touch in that way. Um, but I do live on my own now, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and so how, you know, coping through that loss and both losses early and, and, and late, how have, how is that, uh, what tools have you learned through that that have helped you through the current pandemic in terms of, you know, knowing that it's, uh, not going to be forever and that you there are some um, uh, very important well, you know it, it's interesting I hardly can compare what I'm going through now with what I've been through and I guess my advice is yeah COVID-19 is very hard it's very hard on us financially it's very hard on us in that we're we're isolated and uh, and our futures are uncertain that our paths will change and in both of my episodes my paths my path changed as a result of what I experienced and if COVID-19 is another path that has to change, well, I guess it has to change. But that, you know, we can survive. And how do we survive? We keep ourselves well. We diet, we eat properly. I mean, I'm a big yoga fan, as you know. Um, and we do what gives us a lot of pleasure. And give ourselves permission. I do some meditation. We give ourselves permission to look after ourselves. Well, those are great great tips i hope um we'll we'll end this here um but i hope uh unless myrna you have something else to say no, that's about it fantastic there are a there's a couple of comments in here that i'd like to just read to to the audience because they may not have gone out to everybody um so there so just for the audience if you want to make a comment make sure it goes to all panelists and attendees so the, the, everyone can see them but there's a couple of really good comments here there's someone up in the audience who's a resident mother of three and she'd like to thank dr lichter for this message she says, I think I really needed that advice right now. So thank you for that. Um, and then Rob says that the advice applies to everyone, which I think is absolutely true. And then Brad Cates is just upset that he missed his many petty with Myrna. So maybe we can look that up. Well, so. no time, Brad. Uh, <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. Yeah. <laughs> so those are very profound messages, Myrna. I agree they apply to our male colleagues and our female colleagues who have young families. And you're very, uh, in terms of our taking care of ourselves uh, during this time and the me real message of that we're not alone. And if any of us need anyone, there are many of us around um, and are here to help in any way that we can. So that's a very profound message, Myrna. Thank you. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. <laughs>
Myrna and Vada, thank you for that. It's, it's very much needed in this time. Uh, with that said, I will pass it on to John to introduce um, the next session. Thank you very much, Myrna, as well. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Edward Morgolan. Um, he's a uh, <clears throat> well-known figure in our department and uh, I think across uh, Canada and North America. He completed his medical school at West Virginia University and did his residency at McGill and then completed a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology at the University of Michigan with Drs. Trope and Kornblath. And despite practicing neuro-ophthalmology at U of T for over 10 years now, with the passage of time, he says he's loving neuro-ophthalmology even more, not less. He loves teaching neuro-ophthalmology to both ophthalmology and neurology residents and is definitely a favorite teacher within our department. He also wants you to know that he loves loud screaming and lots of commotion as he gets to come home to experience it every day with his five children. So please feel free to make lots of commotion in the chat, ask him lots of questions. Welcome, Dr. Margolin. Perfect, and as we get set up with him, I think we just have uh, a quick polling question that we'd like to start off with before every session, just to get an understanding of where everyone's from. So maybe you can select that. And this also gets everyone used to how to use the polls uh, because we will be using them quite a bit during um, the rest of this session. So excellent. So we've got quite a bit of audience participation there. So I'll share the results. So as is typical, I think most of, the, most of our audience is from Canada, but we do have people from the Caribbean and Australia, believe it or not, uh, the, the US and Europe. So it's, it's really nice to be able to connect with our international colleagues. Um, and one more poll, just as a housekeeping thing before we hand it off. Um, at some point, we have to get back to uh, somewhat of a regular schedule. And I, we believe that as we head into June, um, offices may start or will start opening up and Grand Rounds will again move to a morning time. And these times are Eastern time. So we're asking the audience if they prefer a 7 a.m. Eastern start time or a 7.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern start time, keeping in mind um, their office and OR preferences. So I'll, I'll give that one 7 a.m. I expect you to show up. <laughs> I'm there every week, so don't pick it unless you mean it. <laughs> so we'll give that another couple seconds to run. And 63% picked 7:30. So John, you're you're safe. You're safe on that one. And with that said, I will pass this off to Ed, who can start his screen share if he wishes. Second. Hi everybody. Hope you can hear me well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have planned for these rounds before the pandemic. And so we're going to do them in a little bit more traditional format in that I will give a little prelude to our cases and then the cases will be presented by our star residents. All of our residents are star residents, um, but uh, we couldn't pick everybody. So, and uh, our neuro-ophthalmology fellow. So, as you've gathered from the, um, from the topic, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> third nerve palsies. Now, we're going to present to you exotic cases of third nerve palsies, not the run of the mill ones. Uh, although, of course, remember the run of the mill ones are the more common ones. And uh, before I begin, I want to use this technique, which is called a memory palace. Let's see, can you see my screen, Amandeep? No, okay, uh, let me just... Not, not yet, so you gotta hit share okay. screen. Yeah, let me just share my screen. There you go. There you go. Um, we're gonna use this technique called a memory palace. So I'm going to tell you a little story um, about a person and uh, hopefully that story will trigger your limbic memory and you will uh, recall more about the third nerve palsy and its anatomy after the story. And after the story, we will launch into the cases. We have three cases that we'll share with you. And at the end, I will read you a portion of that story again to kind of really cement it. The most important point that we want to relate today through that story. So again, hi, everybody. My name is Third. Yes, it's a weird name, but my parents thought that three is a lucky number. So um, there you go. I am a lawyer and I work downtown Toronto, but not in a huge skyscraper, but in an old historic, but very, very important building, 
on a very prestigious street because my company is very exclusive and it's very important. And we called our building a STEM because everything in the society stems from our building. I love, what I, I love what I do at work, but really most of it, I want to get home. And getting home for me is not easy. My path is very long. I started by walking through a very long corridor on my floor, which someone for some reason called the fascicles. And as I go through this hallway, I pass through the uh, office of a small but very important company that is responsible for stability, stability of our financial markets. And then I pass through the office of a very large company that is responsible for making our whole country move. They deal with transport logistics. So I know that if I were to go down for anything wrong that I've done, it will be together with one of these companies. And once I'm out of my building, my long travel just begins. Um, I have to first get on the Don Valley Parkway, which feels like a huge cistern full of cars moving in all different directions. And they're taking people to all kinds of places. And it's very different being in that cistern because here I'm dependent on other cars and their drivers. If they're unwell or if they do something stupid, we're all in trouble and we'll be stuck in that cistern for a very long time. Now, there's a huge pipe running, running right over the DVP and most of the time, I don't really notice it that it's there, but it has been rumored to occasionally burst. And when it happens, it happens right where the DV DVP connects with the cavernous exit that I have to take to get home. So from the DVP, I have to take this cavernous exit to make it on the road that will eventually take me home. I don't know how it happens, but every time I pass through my cavernous exit, I see other lawyers who work on the sixth and the fourth floors of my building. And I also see the, one, the two who want work on the fifth floor. And somehow we always get to the cavernous exit at the same time. So you can imagine if there's an accident, accident in the small cavernous exit, we're all gonna be stuck. From the cavernous exit, it's really a straight path for me to get home to our exclusive estates with suborbital priced homes. My home is the largest and it's the most special of all of my neighbors. It keeps the eyes of the whole street open for business and moving. I told you that I love being home and I do, but I know that if something happens to my nuclear family at work, it will affect everything that I do very deeply. If this nucleus is damaged by anything, I'll just close both of my eyes and pretend that I'm not there. If something happens to me on DVP, my cistern, I'll also be irritated, inflamed, and infected with anger by the time I reach my cavernous exit. And if there is a pipe burst when the DVP meets the cavernous exit, well, there will be lots of fatalities there. So as I told you, I've got to be very careful traveling home. So with that prelude, I will pass the torch to our first presenter, um, Dr. Eli Kisilevsky. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. So Eli, do you want to try sharing your screen there? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Mogollon. Let me just load it up. Perfect. So I'm Eli Kisilevsky. I'm one of the third year residents here at UFD. And first, I just want to thank Dr. Jeeva Patel and Dr. Mogollon for giving me this opportunity to present. It's not often that we as residents get to present in front of uh, 200 plus people. So I hope uh, this will be educational. And I'll be presenting the case of Mr. Weber. And just to be clear, this is a pseudonym. It's not his real name. It's just the name that we created for this presentation. So going along with the narrative storytelling, I want you to put yourself in Mr. Weber's daughter's shoes for a minute. It was just a regular morning. Uh, nothing was amiss. 
but by 9 a.m. she noticed that her dad hasn't come downstairs yet. So she thought she should check up on him. When she came up to uh, his room, uh, she walked through the door and she saw him lying in his bed with his eyes closed and he's motionless. So immediately her mind raced to the absolute worst outcome that she could think of. And she thought he may have passed away in his sleep overnight. As she starts stepping towards his bed, she sighed a sigh of relief because she could see that he was breathing normally and she was much more relaxed. When she started speaking to him, he was answering her the usual way he does, but he wasn't opening his eyes. So that got her a little worried. At first she thought, she thought maybe he's joking around, he's just pretending to sleep or just being silly. But the more she was talking to him, he was responding just the way she would expect, but he was really just not opening his eyes. And even asking him to open her, his eyes, he just would not do it. When she lifted his eyelids with her fingers, she noticed his eyes aren't straight. So that got her really worried. Mr. Weber is 86 years old, he's had multiple strokes in the past, and she knew that this couldn't be anything good. So she knew the next step would be to take him to the emergency department. When she got him up and ready to go and into the car, she also noticed that he's walking a little bit unsteady and that he seems to be favoring one side. So she definitely knew that something is going wrong. When they came to the emergency department, as you'd expect with any patient that has any neurological symptoms, he was assessed and they did a CT scan of his brain. It's fast, it's uh, simple, and it's very informative in many cases. But in his case, it didn't show anything unusual. Uh, he's had a very abnormal CT scan because of his previous strokes, but there weren't any acute changes. So at that point, they decided they would have consult uh, consulting service to be able to un, uh, find the diagnosis. So the neurology service was called. After their assessment, they couldn't completely pinpoint exactly what's going on with a single lesion somewhere in, along the central nervous system. So they felt like it may be a more of a diffuse process in the peripheral nervous system. And their diagnosis at that point was a Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome being an autoimmune disorder that uh, causes demyelination preferentially to the motor nerves. Uh, and Miller-Fisher variant is the one that presents with a phthalmoplegia as well. Because it's an autoimmune disorder, the treatment often is steroids or intravenous immunoglobulins. And that's, uh, in his case, that's what he was treated with, with IVIG, and he was admitted to the hospital. In his hospital stay, he was receiving treatment, but he didn't seem to improve at all. And as you'd expect with an elderly patient that can't open his eyes and can't really orient himself, he was starting to become more delirious. So at that point, they decided to call us to see if we had any input on his diagnosis and his treatment. It was fairly easy to spot him in the nursing station because he was the only person that seems to be speaking to people, but is not opening his eyes. And this is what he looked like. <laughs> um, as you can see, there's obvious ptosis uh, bilaterally. And when we open his eyelids, we can see that he's obviously exotropic, but I'll have you notice that the pupils are symmetrical and reactive to light. In terms of his, of his extraocular motility, he has definitely limited depression of both eyes and elevation is limited as well. He's having a really hard time keeping his eyes open. On a horizontal gaze, you can see that abduction is intact but adduction is limited in both directions. So looking again to the right, is able to look to the right with the right eye, but not with the left. And similarly in the opposite direction. Again, on vertical movements, he tries again to look up, is not very not able to. And looking down, he has very li limited movements. So to recap what we have so far, we have an elderly gentleman with a sudden onset of hemiparesis, bilateral ptosis and bilateral deficits of elevation, depression, and adduction. And so far, the only investigation that we had was an unenhanced CT scan that uh, didn't show any changes. So based on this information, what would you think the diagnosis is? And Amandeep, if you can start to the poll for that. So the poll is launched. In the meanwhile, um, if any of the panelists want to comment on the case so far, they can. But I'll let this run for a few more seconds.
Okay, we've got so we got a pretty good um, return there. So the majority of your audience, Ellie, thinks it's bilateral third nerve palsies, which is not not surprising. But we'll talk about that in a second. So based on that diagnosis, what would you do next? And if you can launch the next uh, poll. So when we came to see this man, just to give you a picture, it was really a bit surreal. He is a, he's in a wheelchair outside of his room with, you know, he, he keeps his chin up and both of his eyes are completely closed. And the nurses are telling us that he looks like he's sleeping the whole day. But really, you just saw he, he ain't sleeping. He just can't open his eyes. So he looks like he's asleep, but he's wide awake. Okay, that's great. So the majority uh, of your audience wants some imaging, most of, mostly MRI brain or CT angio. That's perfect. Then we'll, we'll definitely talk about that. So uh, that's excellent. I think most of you knew it's a third nerve palsy. I think, especially if you read the title of the Grand Rounds or you listened to Dr. Mongolian's introduction. But it, to really understand why this is a third nerve palsy, and specifically, this is actually a nuclear third nerve palsy, we have to talk about the anatomy of the nucleus and the, and the brainstem. As Dr. Margolin mentioned, uh, the, the course of the third nerve uh, passes through a lot of important parts, but I'll focus on the nucleus specifically and the brainstem. As you can see in this axial cut here of the brainstem, the um, third nerve nucleus is located in the dorsal midbrain and it's adjacent to the cerebral aqueduct. And as the fibers of the third nerve exit the nucleus, they run through the red nucleus, which is important for motor coordination, and they exit adjacent to the cerebral peduncle, which is part of the motor um, system. There's, there are a lot of other important structures that are adjacent to this, but they don't usually play a role with third nerve palsy, so I'm not going to talk to, uh, about them. And looking specifically at the nucleus of the third nerve itself, it's quite large and quite complex, so it's important to understand this anatomy. And this illustration is from Dr. Wong's book on eye movement disorders, and it's a, it's a nice illustration to understand this anatomy. There's a rostral to caudal orientation of the nucleus, which plays an important role in the presentations that we see. And there's multiple subnuclei that make up the nucleus uh, for each of the extraocular muscles that the third nerve innervates. And as you can see here, most of the subnuclei are paired subnuclei, meaning that there's a, a, a single subnucleus for each side, for each muscle in each eye. The exception to that is the central caudal nucleus, as the, you can see in the red circle here in Fioli, denoted with CCN, and which innervates both levators of both eyelids. And the edinger westphal nucleus, which is the, along the, dorsal, the rostral aspect of the nucleus, which innervates both of the pupils. This organization is important to appreciate because that allows us to understand when there's lesions that affect the nucleus specifically and when we can definitely rule out the nucleus being involved. So um, like we saw in this patient, if you have a patient that has bilateral third nerve palsies and normal pupils, uh, you can definitely know that it's a lesion affecting the nucleus of the third nerve because as you can see in, the, in this diagram, if it's sparing the edinger westphal nucleus, which is the, on the rostral aspect of the nucleus, you can wipe out all of the other subnuclei uh, sparing the pupils, as we saw in this case. The alternative to that would be a bilateral third nerve palsy with normal levator function when it's more of a ventral or rostral lesion that affects all of the other subnuclei but sparing the central caudal nucleus. The alternative to that, uh, when we can definitely rule in a nuclear cause for a third nerve palsy, is a patient presenting with a unilateral third nerve palsy, but bilateral involvement of the superior recti and bilateral ptosis. And that's because, like I mentioned, the central cotton nucleus innervates both levators. So if you uh, have any lesion affecting the nucleus, you would automatically involve both of them. And the superior rectus subnuclei are quite close to each other and the fibers decussate, so it's virtually impossible to affect only one subnucleus. On the flip side, using this knowledge, we can definitely rule out nuclear causes for a third nerve palsy in anybody with a unilateral superduction deficit or a unilateral ptosis for the same reason. So this was a lot of information and a lot of nitty gritty neuroanatomy. So you might be wondering why do you really need to know any of these things? We're ophthalmologists after all, we're not neurologists we're probably never going to see this, and we haven't seen this before. And that's true. All of these cases are very, very rare. 
third nerve palsy in general is rare, and a nuclear third nerve palsy is even more rare. But as ophthalmologists, we still should be able to recognize a third nerve palsy, and especially when it presents in an unusual way or when there's involvement of other pathways causing other neurological signs. So to better describe these types of presentations, there are a few syndromes that all have eponyms. Weber syndrome, Benedict syndrome, and Claude syndrome. And when I was faced with this list, I did what anybody else would do, uh, looking at a bunch of names that have non-descriptive syndromes to try to better understand them and better remember them. So looking at PubMed, the first thing I realized is that this type of Weber syndrome is definitely not a popular type of Weber syndrome. And the other thing is that Dr. Weber has worked really hard and named a lot of different syndromes. What I did learn though, is that I wasn't the only one. There is some confusion in terms of naming the syndromes and what they actually mean uh, in terms of the clinical presentation. And there's also debate about using eponyms in general and whether they're helpful in defining clinical entities. What I learned from all of this though, is that understanding of the neuroanatomy can really help us understand these syndromes and even remember them. So first Weber syndrome, is the most commonly described syndrome that we can see, and that presents with a third nerve palsy and a contralateral hemiparesis because of an involvement of the cerebral peduncle, as you can see here. And just to be clear, this is the fascicles of the third nerve and the cerebral peduncle, it's not a nuclear third nerve palsy. Uh, similarly, Benedict syndrome involves the red nucleus and the fascicles of the third nerve and presents with third nerve palsy and contralateral tremor. And finally, Claude syndrome presents with contralateral, uh, sorry, ipsilateral cerebral or ataxia from involvement of the superior cerebellar peduncle, which is not shown in this image because I couldn't really find a good image that actually uh, shows it at all in a single slice. What I also found as part of all of this is that there's a memory aid that helps you remember these syndromes and defining them. So the memory aid is weak Weber, bobbing Benedict, and clumsy Claude. Weak Weber for the hemiparesis, bobbing Benedict for the tremor, and clumsy clod for the ataxia. So putting this all together and going back to our patient, the next step is like most of you voted is an MRI of the brain. We need to better images uh, brain parenchyma to be able to understand what is actually going on. And as you can see here on the T2 single, sing, sing, <coughs> signal on the left, uh, there's a T2 hyperintensity in the cerebral and the periaqueductal gray matter, as well as the cerebellar peduncle. And comparing this to all of the images that I showed you before, it's actually turned around um, just because by convention, anatomy slides and neuroanatomy are rotated compared to radiological slides. But nonetheless, you can appreciate that the nucleus of the third nerve is involved here and the cerebral peduncle is involved right here. And on the right here, we have diffusion weighted imaging, which uses the property of uh, diffusion of water molecules in and out of slides to better image uh, ischemia and edema that's resulting from that. And you can see with these nice red arrows that the same areas are hyperintense on diffusion weighted imaging, which indicates an acute or subacute stroke in the same area. Other scans, all, other slides also show that there's other multiple areas of stroke that he sustained at the same time. And ultimately the culprit was found to be an ulcerating plaque in his left subclavian artery. Uh, he was treated appropriately with anticoagulation for this, and ultimately he was able to be discharged. So just to summarize what we had, we have a, an elderly gentleman that initially was thought to be dead by his family just because he couldn't open his eyes. But this bilateral can all be explained by a nuclear third nerve palsy. What I want you to remember from all of this is that we often see patients with ptosis or extraocular motility deficits but there are several ones that it's critical for us not to miss. So any patient presenting with a new third nerve palsy, and especially anyone with a third nerve palsy and other neurological symptoms such as ataxia or motor deficits, all should be referred urgently to the emergency department for appropriate neuroimaging to rule out involvement of the brainstem. And specifically to the brainstem, we know that any lesions can present either as an isolated third nerve palsy and in the case of a nuclear third nerve palsy, we know what that would look like as a unilateral third nerve palsy with bilateral ptosis and elevation deficit. 
or bilateral thermal palsy that spares the levator or the pupils, as we saw in this patient. When we do see a thermal palsy that involves other neurological symptoms, the most common one would be a gait disturbance. So we shouldn't for forget our friends, weak Weber, Robbing Benedict, and clumsy Claude. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Um, and uh, we'll maybe continue to the next question, next presenter, unless anybody has any burning questions, then we'll leave all the questions to the end. So the, the really this case in a nutshell was that this man came in and his presentation um, was unusual and then he appeared to have, the neurology thought multiple cranial nerve policies that they couldn't really map out to one they thought it was multiple cranial nerve palsy. The patient was really poorly cooperating and they noticed that he was also weak. And again, the exam was difficult. They couldn't really uh, clearly localize it to one side or the other. And um, eventually we were able to localize it to one area um, in the midbrain. And he ended up having, as Ellie mentioned, multiple strokes in different vascular distributions. So the embolic source was looked for and was found. Um, okay, so we will pass on the torch to Michael Nguyen. Michael, who is, we're, and remember, we're traveling on the third highway. So we started with the nucleus. And now we're going to be traveling outwards. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Nguyen. I'm one of the PGY2 residents. I'd like to thank Trish, the Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellow, and Dr. Margolin for the chance to present uh, this case. Uh, the title of my case is A Tale of Two Cisterns. So jump into the case. We have a 72-year-old female who's uh, presenting the clinic with a right upper eyelid droop that's been progressive, and, and she's actually complaining of diplopia now for the past three months. Her lid is now completely closed, and she denies any other neurological or ocular symptoms. In terms of her past medical history, this is actually a very challenging past medical history to uh, obtain from her, but you can see here that she actually has a history of stage four breast cancer that has unfortunately metastasized to her lung pleura, to her spine, uh, to her mediastinal and to her axillary lymph nodes. She's currently receiving chemotherapy for this. Uh, of note, she also has a remote large pituitary macroadenoma that was resected uh, 23 years ago, followed by radiation therapy at that time as well. Of note here, she does not have any vascular risk factors such as diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol. On examination, she was 2020 bilaterally without any RAPD, and she also had a normal fundus examination in both eyes. Here are clinical external photographs of her eyes. The top figure shows a right complete ptosis of the right eye, and the bottom figure shows the eyelids that are manually retracted with a right mid-dilated pupil that was unreactive to light. And there's also an anisocoria of two millimeters. Uh, this is greater seen in light conditions. This is a more complicated figure showing the patient's extraocular motility with their eyelids manually retracted. This slide is a bit more busy, so let me walk you through it. If you look at the central panel, this is the patient at primary gaze, and you can see that her right eye is in a down and out configuration. If you keep following the right eye, you see that there is limited superduction, there is limited adduction, and there is slightly limited infraduction, but there is normal abduction. If you look at the left eye, she is ortho at primary, and there is normal superduction, abduction, infraduction, and adduction of that eye. So to summarize quickly, we have a 72-year-old female with a right complete ptosis and anisocoria with a right larger pupil. She also has limited a deduction, superduction, and infraduction. So what is going on here? Can we bring the poll up? It's not a very challenging question, but does she have more likely myasthenia gravis or a third nerve palsy? Okay, I'm going to end the poll here because I've never seen such a lopsided result. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That's great. 99% of people thought it was a third nerve palsy, and that is excellent. That is the answer. Um, not only because this is the topic of the grand rounds, but we know this because her pupils are involved. 
And the important thing to learn from this is that in myasthenia gravis, the pupils are never involved. The reason for this is that myasthenia gravis is a disorder of skeletal muscle and not of the visceral muscle. In myasthenia gravis, the antibodies are directed against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And since the pupil has muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, we should not expect any pupillary involvement in myasthenia gravis. So that's why we know that this patient does not have myasthenia gravis. As we all should know by now, the first and most important thing to do for this patient is to rule out aneurysmal compression. And this is often done with a uh, CT, CTA, but uh, some uh, neurologists and radiologists prefer an MRI, MRA. This is typically more likely for us to be a CT, uh, CTA. However, for her, she actually uh, had some imaging at an outside center two weeks before seeing us. And we were not able at this time to find the images. So we have to um, live with the report. And this is the summary of the report. It said that there was a stable enlargement of her pituitary gland uh, from known pituitary macroadenoma post-resection, post-radiation. Uh, there was a port, uh, reportedly no abnormalities along the course of the third nerves, and there was no brain metastasis. Now what should we do? So we have a report of a normal MRI with contrast from an outside source that was apparently normal. Should we proceed to do MRI orbits? Should we try an MRA and MRI with something called cis sequences? Should we proceed to lumbar puncture, or should we try and get venous imaging with an MRV? Okay, I think we've got a pretty astute audience here. So I'm gonna end the poll again, pretty lopsided once again. Perfect, so I'm assuming that 84% of people chose to do an MRA and MRI with cyst sequences, and this is great. And that's what we got as well. And let me walk you through what we ordered. So we ordered an MRI, MRA of the brain and orbits with cyst sequences. The reason why we got the MRA, of course, is to review the vascular structure and to rule out aneurysmal compression. This is, of course, a life-threatening cause of a third nerve palsy, and rupture of this can cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which has significant morbidity and mortality, and an MRI by itself may not be sensitive enough to pick up these smaller aneurysms. Uh, we wanted to include orbital imaging because sometimes there is subtle pathology in the orbits that the larger scans through the brain uh, will not pick up. So sometimes you want to ask for dedicated orbital imaging to pick up the more subtle pathologies. And the last thing is something you may not recognize, which is called CIST sequences. And CIST stands for Constructive Interference Steady State. Essentially, it's a sequence of choice that we typically like to use when we're trying to visualize the entire course of the cranial nerve. So when Dr. Margolin was talking about the entire third highway, that's what he was trying to talk about when we want to look at these cis, uh, sequences. Here are two uh, radio images side to side of the patients that we got for her. Um, they're both axial T1 weighted images uh, showing before and after uh, intravenous contrast injection in the left and right respectively. So you can see here on the right side, using my favorite sign in radiology, which is the arrow sign, you can clearly see that there is diffuse smooth enhancements of the bilateral cisternal segments of the oculomotor nerves. And just to reiterate that these are not actually the cis sequences I was talking about because of how obvious this pathology is. So just to know that this is not normal and you would not normally see this if the patient didn't have this pathology. We were able to dig around and actually saw her original MRI. And in the original MRI, you can see that even here, after contrast, you can see that there is still the enhancement of the bilateral cisternal segments of both the cranial uh, nerves. And again, this is not normal and this should not be so readily seen. Now, if your face looks a lot like this emoji right now, after hearing that slide and hearing the words enhancement of cisternal portion of ocular motor nerves, that's okay. Since this is neuro-ophthalmology, I think I'm not the only one that's a bit confused. So while preparing this presentation, I made a list of frequently asked questions to a neuro-ophthalmologist and had Dr. Margolin help answer them for me. And you can continue to look for this emoji throughout the presentation and see if your face matches what the emoji looks like. The first question I had was, what is the cisternal portion of cranial nerve three? In medical school and our neuroanatomy, I don't recall this cisternal portion being talked about a lot. And even in residency, we often don't focus on this part when we're talking about the course of the oculomotor nerve. Uh, the first question is, what is a cistern? Well, a cistern in real life is just a receptacle for holding water. Uh, the picture I had at the beginning of my presentation was of the famous basilica cisterns that is uh, beneath Istanbul in Turkey. But in neuroanatomy, a cistern is simply a CSF-filled space around another structure. So on the left here, you can see an axial cartoon of the course of the oculomotor nerve. 
So to orient everyone, if you look down here, this is the Mickey Mouse of the midbrain. And in green, you see the two uh, paired ocular motor nuclei. And here, you can see the fascicle that Ellie was talking about as it travels anteriorly past the red nucleus, past the cerebral peduncle, and into the subarachnoid space. It is in this subarachnoid space at this gray arrow where you can see the ocular motor nerve enter through a porous. And it's in this porous that there is this sleeve and in this sleeve is CSF fluid, and this is the cistern that we're talking about when we're talking about the cisternal portion of cranial nerve three. To further orient everyone, if you follow the cistern more anterolaterally, you'll arise into the cavernous sinus, and then if you keep proceeding forward, you would go through the superior orbital fissure, and then finally into the orbit. So this is kind of what we're talking about when we talk about the cisternal segments. On the other side with these two white arrows, this is just the sleeve cut open so that you can in fact see that it is the ocular motor nerve as it continues to travel forward. And if you look on this uh, image here, this is the same T1 weighted uh, axial image that I just showed you, where you can see now that there is clearly smooth enhancements of the ocular motor nerves, even without the arrow sign uh, to see the enhancement. Now, the second question you may have is why would a cranial nerve enhance? This is a bit of an easier question to answer. And for this, you just need to remember the three eyes of enhancement. So when something enhances on neuroimaging, you should always think about these three things. Number one is infection. Number two is infiltration. Sometimes this can be benign, such as a um, primary schwannoma, but it can often be more malignant, such as lymphoma, leukemia. And especially for our patient, you might worry about uh, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis from her metastatic breast cancer. And finally, you always want to think about number three, which is inflammation. We're more familiar with this in the form of demyelination from MS, but they could be more rare etiologies, such as radiation-induced, or even rarer etiologies, such as ophthalmoplegic migraine, which has recently been renamed into recurrent painful ophthalmoplegic neuropathy, which thankfully is a, mainly a pediatric condition that we would not be so worried about in our patient. So what should we do next? So if you're thinking about this now, we have a 72-year-old female with known metastatic breast cancer, and she has a complete pupil involving third nerve palsy. We're trying to rule out the three eyes of enhancement, especially infection and infiltration. So logically, that would of course take us to the lumbar puncture. So she had a large volume lumbar puncture, which thankfully showed a normal composition of glucose and protein, no white cells, no red cells, and no malignant cells on cytology. Of note, she had something called a large volume lumbar puncture, and this is when they need to remove up to three to four times the regular amount of fluid for an LP. So it's not an insignificant uh, procedure that a patient needs to go through when they're looking for malignant cells for cytology. So what should we do next? We have a normal LP, supposedly, which basically rules out any form of infection. But really, when we're worried about uh, malignancy, these uh, cells can be quite hard to catch, even on a large volume LP. So we wanted to repeat this LP to see if there was any malignant cells in cytology. And again, thankfully for her, she had a normal um, CSF analysis with no malignant cells seen on cytology. So now I'll pose the question to you. What would you do next in this patient? Should we try and do a third high volume LP? Should we simply observe the patients at this time? Should we call neurosurgery and ask them to do a biopsy of the cisternal segments of the third nerve? Or should we presume that it's just leptomeningeal carcinomatosis and proceed with intrathecal chemotherapy? So the results are coming a little bit more slowly this time, Mike. I think you've stumped the audience. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll give this another minute, or sorry, a couple more seconds to run, and then I'll share the results with you. But it is much more split this time as I see, see the results live. So here it is, Good. pretty even split here. That's great. So most people would observe, and some people want to do a third high volume LP. Some people want to call neurosurgery to get a biopsy of the third nerve. Some people want to uh, start chemotherapy. Wow, that's great. That's really good. Um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to do another lumbar puncture, um, even though she's already had two high volume LPs that were both clean. And as you can imagine, the patient pretty adamantly refused to do another large volume LP. In fact, she was pretty upset to even come back to see us again. You could imagine she was referred to ophthalmology for a problem with her eye. Not only were we not able to figure out what was definitively going on with her eye, but we had to do MRIs, we had to do MRAs, we had to give her a contrast, we had to repeat all that again. Then we had to do a lumbar puncture that was high volume. Then we had to repeat that lumbar puncture again. And then now we want to do another lumbar puncture. 
uh, to see if we can find something, even the last two have been clean. So she obviously refused that. Um, and now you might be wondering to yourself, why are we doing so many lumbar punctures? You know, she's already had two high volume lumbar punctures that were clean. Why do we want to keep going? What are we looking for? And in fact, the yield of LPs for malignancy actually continues to increase up until the fifth one. So that's why we're doing so many LPs. And when we have such a high pretest probability of someone with metastatic breast cancer already, we are very worried about leptomeningeal disease. So that's why we wanted to look for these, excuse me, malignant cells on cytology. But of course, we couldn't do that. So just to summarize where we are right now, we have a patient with a right pupil involving cranial nerve 3 palsy. She's 72 and has breast cancer. There was this bilateral enhancement on the cisternal segments of the cranial nerve 3 on the MRI. And like I said, she's had this underlying metastatic breast cancer, but has been negative so far on LP. So it's still got to be the cancer, right? I'll give the audience a few uh, seconds here to just think to themselves maybe, if there's anything on the history that you remember that may help broaden our differential uh, for this patient, because we've effectively ruled out aneurysmal compression with our MRA, and she doesn't have any vascular risk factors that would make us think of a micro ischemic cause. So could there be something else on the history that was helpful to us and could help broaden our differential? And if you uh, think, uh, thought to yourself that this patient had a history of radiation therapy, you would absolutely be correct. So you remember that in her past medical history, she not only has this current active metastatic breast cancer, but she has a previous history of a pituitary macroadenoma that was resected and treated 23 years ago with radiation therapy. So now we can add to our differential diagnosis. Not only are we worried about leptomeningeal disease, we could perhaps entertain the idea that she has something called a radiation-induced cranial nerve neuropathy. So what did we do if we couldn't get that third high volume LP? So what we decided to do instead was to simply observe her, as most of you chose to do. And uh, six months later, we uh, amazingly convinced her to do yet another MRI with more contrast to see if anything had changed in her brain. And this is uh, a, an axial T1 image again. This is uh, a different uh, center, different MRI machine, and a different protocol. So that's why the quality looks a bit different. But it basically shows that there's still this persistence enhancement of the bilateral cisternal segments of both of the ocular motor nerves. Again, here you can see the enhancement here, and you can see the enhancement here. And when we talked to the oncologist who is currently taking care of her, um, there was no change in her third nerve palsy clinically. So she still has that complete ptosis and the limitations in the extraocular motility. So we can be pretty confident now in our final answer that her diagnosis is a presumed radiation-induced cranial nerve neuropathy. How do we come to this conclusion? Well, we know that she's had two large volume LPs that did not have any cytology that shows any malignant cells. Thankfully, her MRI is otherwise normal, meaning that there was no leptomeningeal enhancement seen on any of the MRIs that she's had, even the one six months later. And the most important thing is she's doing systemically well uh, six months later with no signs of any new uh, uh, cancer in her body and her, she's still undergoing treatment for her current uh, cancer from her oncologist. So it's at this point that we're able to say that this is you know, radiation induced and we are able to report this as the longest reported interval between radiation therapy and development of a cranial neuropathy. And this is in fact 23 years and was recently presented at the last NANOS meeting. A few more points on radiation induced cranial nerve neuropathy. Um, obviously from our neuroanatomy, we know that the pituitary gland is very close to the cavernous sinuses. So when patients undergo radiation uh, treatments, the radiation field will obviously include these cisternal portions of the cranial nerves. And therefore, this should be on the differential for anyone with a cranial nerve palsy and any previous history of radiation therapy. As for the pathophysiology, uh, the complete mechanisms are not fully understood, but we think that the two main players are nerve compression from extensive radiation-induced fibrosis as well as a direct injury to the nerves and the blood vessels leading to ischemia to the basa nervorum, which are the blood vessels that supply the nerves. Um, and there could also be a role for an endotheliopathy to play as well. We're not too sure though why it took 23 years for this patient to, man uh, to manifest these, uh, uh, the third nerve palsy, but we presume that it was because the damage has been ongoing for the last 23 years, but we're subclinical until most recently.
you might be thinking to yourself now, why don't we see post-radiation cranial nerve palsies more often? In ophthalmology, we often worry the most about, you know, the lens sustaining damage, leading to cataracts or things such as radiation retinopathy or optic neuropathy, secondaries of radiation damage. We, we often don't think or hear too much about radiation-induced uh, cranial nerve palsies. And the reason for that, again, can be traced back to neuroanatomy. The ocular motor cranial nerves, so three, four, and six, are more radio resistant than the optic nerve two. And the reason for that is that three, four, and six do not have any myelin, and their function depends more on the integrity of Schwann cells, which are much more radio resistant compared to the oligodendrocytes, which help supply the optic nerves with myelin. And these are more radio sensitive and are more likely to be damaged. So that is one of the reasons. Another reason is after having reviewed the literature, it's been noted that allele uh, pharyngeal tumors and other skull-based tumors lower down that also receive radiation therapy um, are quite at risk for developing radiation-induced cranial nerve neuropathies, but they have a lot of follow-up from our head and neck uh, colleagues. Typically, when uh, cancers of the cella um, have radiation therapy, the follow-up uh, period is much shorter. So therefore, if there's any uh, cranial nerve palsies that happen outside of this follow-up, it may be missed. And furthermore, when these uh, events do show up, sometimes they could be misdiagnosed as a micro ischemic vascular third instead of uh, pursuing more dedicated radio imaging um, uh, to see what the true etiology is. Some astute listeners in the audience, I'm sure, thought about this, but this patient had enhancement of the cisternal portion of the bilateral cranial nerves. So why did they only manifest with unilateral disease? There was a case series actually looking at um, uh, cisternal portion enhancements of the third nerve a few decades ago, and they found that in 13 of the patients they looked at with various etiologies, none of which actually were radiation induced, but this is just to show that there is a wide variety of etiologies that can cause enhancement, as I've talked about, but things like meningitis, leukemia, lymphoma, HIV, Tulsa Hunt, and neurofibromatosis, all of these etiologies can cause uh, enhancement of the cisternal portion. Um, in these 13 patients, six of them actually had bilateral enhancement. But of these six bilateral enhancements, only four of them had unilateral disease, and two of them did not have any clinical disease at all. No one presented with bilateral third nerve palsies. So the reason we think is that even though there was structural damage via the pathophysiological mechanisms I talked about earlier, but they were not yet at a threshold uh, needed for clinically detectable disease. My last question I had was, does this change how I should manage a third nerve palsy as a resident, as a comprehensive ophthalmologist in a patient in the emergency room or the clinic? Does this really change how you should manage your patient with a third nerve palsy? And thankfully, the short answer is no, because the most important thing is to always get urgent, dedicated imaging to rule out a compressive aneurysm. These are the things that can kill our patients, and we want to make sure we don't miss this. So usually this comes in the form of a CT, CTA. The long answer, though, is that the history can be very important, as it is for almost all of our patients, in that you should always be cautious if a patient tells you that they've ever had a history of malignancy at any point in their lives, or if they've had any previous radiation, even if this was uh, 23 years ago. And lastly, it may not always be the common microvascular third nerve palsy, especially if a patient doesn't have any vascular risk factors like ours did. And I always say that when you're in doubt, you should always ask your friendly neighborhood neuro-ophthalmologist. So here are my take-home points. I think that all third nerve palsies need an urgent CT, CTA. If you don't get the answer you're looking for, you can ask for uh, different sequences such as CIS, so constructive interference in steady state. And this can be useful to image the third highway if you do not find your answer. The past medical history will often give you the answer. And cranial nerve enhancement is always abnormal, but may not always be associated with a clinically apparent palsy. And don't forget the three eyes of uh, um, enhancement, infection, infiltration, and inflammation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. We're, we're really a little bit out of time, so we will postpone the questions for now, and we'll, we'll move on to our last case, which will be presented by Dr. Jiva Patel. And uh, Trish, please share your screen with us. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Yeah, I think Michael needs to. Um, oh, you know what? I'll, 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 take, I'll take care of that for you. Yep, done. Thank you.
second. One second, guys. While we're waiting, I just want you to envision yourself traveling. We started with the nucleus, we, we left, we went through the fascicle and we left to brainstem and we spoke about the cisterns, that space, uh, the subarachnoid space that the, um, the third nerve ran through and we're continuing on the same highway moving forward. Um, Dr. Rai, do you see my screen? Yes, we, yes, can, see we, can, we, can, we can see your screen, everything is good. The main screen? Yes. Uh, what we see is close encounters of the third kind. So your title page. Okay, just hold on. It's frozen here. Here, let's. Do you want to try again? Yeah. Maybe try closing. To... Try closing your PowerPoint and. Yeah. So remember, we started in nucleus, then we went through the fascicle to this corridor then entered the GVP, the, the cisternal space, and now we're getting close to leaving the GVP to take this exit off the highway, the cavernous exit, and that's where... Presentation will open up. Um, pause it. We're hoping that no, you all yeah. stay with them. Sorry guys, one second. There we go. Do you see it? Not yet. Share, you the, screen. share oh. the screen. Okay, do you see it? Hmm. Not yet, but share, you share, share the screen? screen. Yeah. Do you see it? Nope, not yet. Uh, hold on, let's try this again. Thank you everybody for staying with us. There you go, perfect. There you go. So while okay, Trisha is doing go. that, I'll, oh, okay. do you have your talk here? Perfect. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so hi, sorry, sorry about the delays. Um, my name is Trisha and I'm the current Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellow. Um, and I'm probably one of the more fortunate fellows because I've managed to continue with my academic and clinical work just because of the subspecialty we're in, in terms of neuroophthalmology, and we tend to definitely see a lot of emergency patients. And so we've actually been able to assist a lot of our ophthalmic patients in this time by continuing to see these emergencies. So moving on to, no surprise here, our third and final take case or talk um, related to our route along the third nerve. Um, and boy, do we have a close encounter for you just before we meet up again with our friends, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. So before I begin, I'd like for you all to consider the atom. The concept of the atom first came about over 2000 years ago. Initially, it was only described and hypothesized as a philosophy described by the ancient Greeks. It stems from the word atomus, briefly translating to mean uncuttable, and aptly named as, at the time, the atom was for a long period of time considered by many a scientist to be the tiniest constituent of all matter and our very being. However, with time, we soon came to realize that these small uncuttable bits of matter were made up of even smaller particles, our electrons, protons, and neutrons. And so what we realized then was what we knew before was not at all everything there is to know. Today, we know even more that even these smaller particles of protons and neutrons are made up of even more elementary particles, your gluons and your quarks, currently considered today to be the most fundamental constituents of all matter. And quite interestingly, whose particle tracks uniquely resemble the skeleton framework of the iris body as depicted in the background image. So truth be told, we don't really know for sure if there really is an end to smallness. Now, keeping that in mind, I now pose this question to you. Even after having heard the two case presentations prior to me with these quite unique etiologies of third nerve palsy, 
how much do you think you really know about cranial nerve three palsy? So we present a case of a 65 year old woman who was otherwise well and known hypertensive, well controlled and very infrequently required visits to her doctor. She presented by about mid-August with new onset left-sided headaches. This persisted for about a month. She then went to a community hospital where at the ED, she underwent a CT brain without contrast, which was reported as normal. There, she was given a script for hydromorphone and sent home. However, two weeks after this, she developed binocular oblique diplopia and worsening headaches, now complaining of left orbital pain. A week after this, she notices a mild left upper lid droop, and she initially reported no other symptoms for giant cell arthritis, and her inflammatory markers were normal. So a family physician then started on empiric antibiotic therapy, and this time re-prescribing hydromorphone with doubling doses. Unfortunately for her, the antibiotic treatment did not do the trick. And so she presented to our neuroophthalmic service two weeks after that. Now with this history of over two months of ongoing severe headache, persistent binocular oblique diplopia, as well as left upper litosis. On examination, she had central visual acuities of 20-25 in each eye, and a slit lamp exam revealed normal anterior and posterior segments. As you can see on inspection, she has this mild left upper litosis. In addition to that, her pupil exam revealed mild anisocoria with the larger pupil on the left, and this was about two millimeters difference between the two eyes, both for light and dark. The extraocular motility testing showed limitations of the left eye. As can be seen here, she has limitation in adduction, normal abduction, as well as now some limitation in supraduction and limitation in left infraduction. So she was diagnosed with a left pupil involving cranial nerve three palsy. So our first order of business was to review her previous neuroimaging. And given these symptoms of chronic headache and left orbital pain, we were concerned as to whether or not there was some sort of pathology in the left cavernous sinus, and perhaps also looking into the area anterior to this towards the orbital apex. So these are the images from that previous CT. And whilst this might be subjective, you can try to see that there may be some subtle thickening and abnormality in the left cavernous sinus, and more so on the right axial view where the arrow is pointing. Um, you can probably appreciate some subtle change and loss of the normal concave contour of that left cavernous sinus. So keeping this in mind, we now ask you this poll question. We have a 65 year old lady who presents with chronic headaches, left orbital pain, and the presence of a pupil involving cranial nerve three palsy. Okay, so I had to end it a little quick there in the interest of time, but people are divided between aneurysm, aneurysmal compression and inflammatory. Good, I got you confused, that was the goal. <laughs> Okay, so as we said previously, and Michael alluded to in his talk, you have a pupil involved cranial of three, and so your first order of business to exclude annual, aneurysmal compression. And so we admitted her, and she was then booked for an urgent CTA. However, while awaiting the scan, she went down to the cafeteria in the hospital. Attention, please. Code blue, Mount Sinai Hospital, main floor, Rio Can Food Court. Attention, please. Code blue, Mount Sinai Hospital, main floor, Rio Can Food Court. So this is something no ophthalmologist, not even a neuro-ophthalmologist is comfortable hearing related to their patient. Our patient, unfortunately, had collapsed in the cafeteria, was rushed to the emergency room, stabilized, and subsequently underwent for urgent CTA. Here we show the initial pre-contrast images of that um, CT study. And what's seen here prominently and what definitely caught the attention of the radiologists was this diffuse, quite smooth, thickening and hyperdensity of the dura. 
It also, as depicted by the arrows, can be seen also extending to the dura along the fox as well as the tentoria. So the angiography study then on the report revealed that there was no evidence of arterial occlusion or arterial stenosis. And relevant to our case, there was no evidence of having seen any aneurysm or vascular malformation. So now I ask you the same poll question, having the CTA um, results. What do you now think the most likely etiology for her third nerve palsy is? And again, we're confusing the matters even more. Okay, so we've gained some traction for inflammatory and we've lost some of those aneurysmal compression colleagues. All right, so as we also thought very similarly to the polling audience, we have all of these features and so we should be considering some sort of inflammatory or infiltrative etiology. So we considered the following diagnoses and that then meant while she was admitted, we further investigated her. She had a CT body, which was normal, and then she underwent an MRI venography, which was also initially reported as unremarkable. However, this patient had now worsening headaches, refractory pain, to an extent where she was almost holding her head in her left hand. And so the neuroradiology team was contacted urgently in person to urgently review that real-time MRI, as we felt there had to be some sort of compressive etiology onto that third nerve on the left side. And so our detective neuroradiologist was now on the case and now having the information from the MRI was able to compare to that previous CT we had done. And so he then realized that that hyperdense thickening which was initially seen um, to be the dura was actually subdural in nature rather than dural thickening. And so with the MRI looking at the same area, he was able to elucidate that this was non-enhancing, ISO intense on the T1 images, and more importantly, on the susceptibility weighting images, it bloomed. And when something blooms on an SWI sequence, it can only mean acute blood. And so looking back at both of the imaging studies, this then was consistent with an acute subdural bleed. So we now have an acute third nerve palsy, evidence on neuroimaging of a subdural hemorrhage. So we have to be thinking aneurysm, but more so we have to be thinking aneurysm with rupture. So our detective neuroradiologist is still on the case, and now he's more interested in looking at this area where the posterior communicating artery runs. And so he goes back to the previous CT angiography study, and with reconstructed views, he finds this. On the MR venography study, he actually pulls it up and looks more at the arterial circulation, which luckily for us was visible, and finds that. And so now we have a diagnosis of a small posterior communicating artery aneurysm that is ruptured, but has ruptured into the subdural space. Just a very quick hint here. Normally when an intracranial aneurysm ruptures, it ruptures into the subarachnoid space. So, just as we know, we know a very little about the atom, we are forced now to ask ourselves, what do we now know about pupil involving cranial of three palsies associated with posterior communicating artery aneurysms? And this leads us to the talk. We have a posterior communicating artery aneurysm that is ruptured into the subdural rather than the subarachnoid space. Well, this has been described in the literature and it is extremely rare, holding only an incidence of 0.5 to 7.9% of all intracranial aneurysms. It tends to usually take place along the course anywhere between the internal carotid artery and posterior cerebral artery, along which you find the posterior communicating artery. According to the literature, it's also more commonly found to present in females. The subdural hemorrhage that occurs purely into the space secondary to an intracranial aneurysm is even more rare, with only about 20 cases being reported in the literature. And this is harder to diagnose, as we've seen in our case, but they tend to hold a better prognosis, which I'll explain shortly. So, in order to better understand the significance of, as well as the difference between a subarachnoid hemorrhage versus a subdural hemorrhage, relating to a rupture of an intracranial aneurysm, 
we're quickly gonna go back to the anatomy relative to the function of this very small area. So firstly, looking at the meningeal layers, we have the pia mater, which I like to think of as pinky to pinky and the brain. Firstly, because we all know with our pinky and our pia, brain cannot take over the world. In addition, pia translates to mean tender mother. And that's not only what pinky is to the brain, but our very well vascularized and sensitive pia is to our brain. The second meningeal layer is then the arachnoid motor membrane. And the space in between is very important being that of the subarachnoid space. And then finally, the last layer of the dura, the outermost I mean, mater of meninges is the outermost layer, the dura mater. So now we're more interested in this subarachnoid space. The subarachnoid space contains numerous delicate connective tissue trabecular meshworks, as well as intercommunicating channels. It also houses very important major arterial vessels, allowing them to traverse this area and then branch off into the pier and cortical tissue to supply them. It also contains your CSF. And the function of this area firstly being obviously to cushion the brain as well as lower down the spinal cord. As we said earlier, the function also housing and protecting these major arterial vessels. And then finally, it also contributes to the blood-brain barrier, preventing blood-borne infections and certain neurotoxins from affecting the central nervous system. So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, normally what would happen is you would get an intracranial aneurysm rupturing into this subarachnoid space. And what would happen from such a rupture is you would get accumulation of blood into this space. That then results in the consequence of raised intracranial pressure, which causes its subsequent clinical sequelae. However, not only does it cause raised intracranial pressure, it also results in the compressive effect onto our very sensitive peer, as well as the brain. And this causes cerebral vasospasm. And the cerebral vasospasm will cause a patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage to say they've now experienced the worst headache of their life. The cerebral vasospasm not is, is not only going to cause a headache, but it's also going to cause arterial vasoconstriction. And the arterial vasoconstriction is what results in cerebral ischemia and its unfortunate clinical sequelae of altered level of consciousness, stroke, seizure, and even in some instances, untimely death for some patients. So we mentioned, however, in some rare instances, you have this intracranial aneurysm rupturing into the subdural space, either initially or purely. So what are the mechanisms related to why this happens? And so the first mechanism described, and which is the mechanism we think occurred in our patient, is that you initially get a leaking aneurysm causing little small minor adhesions from the hemorrhage. These adhesions build up and they almost um, seal off the rest of the subarachnoid space, until which point this accumulation of blood then bursts into the subdural space instead. A second mechanism at play in these instances may be that you have an aneurysm that builds up with blood until there's an expansion of this blood, and there's such a high pressure system resulting in a velocity directed hemorrhage that then occurs because of the attachment to the arachnoid membrane directly into the subdural space instead. So now we can appreciate the clinical difference between the fallout of what happens when we have an intracranial aneurysm rupturing into the subarachnoid space over the subdural space. We can also appreciate and see why a rupture into the subdural space holds a better prognosis because there's actually a delay in not only the raised intracranial pressure effects, but also the cerebral vasospasm, ischemia, and its clinical complications. So we also mentioned earlier that these cases are more difficult to diagnose. And this then brings us to probably what is the most important clinical slide and take home message today. Why was the aneurysm missed on our initial CTA? So specifically related to this case, there was an unusual pattern of diffuse what was initially dubbed dural thickening. So this unusual pattern of hemorrhage within the subdural space that spread quite diffusely, distracted the radiologists initially, and obviously resulted in less attention being paid to the angiography study. However, the literature also does demonstrate that with these subdural hemorrhages related to intracranial aneurysm rupture, they do tend to be more difficult to diagnose. 
because even if they do form subdural hematomas, which can be well delineated on imaging, in the acute and subacute setting, this acute subdural blood is actually isodense to the brain parenchyma, more so on your CT imaging. And so they are often missed originally until possibly the patient's clinical situation deteriorates and new imaging is then undertaken. Also related to the radiological appearance is that from when compared to non-ruptured aneurysms, ruptured aneurysms contain a higher degree or concentration of thrombosed blood. And this then makes it more difficult to visualize on the neuroimaging, particularly because any angiography study is dependent on flow through a blood vessel and contrasted flow through a blood vessel, as well as flow into an aneurysmal site. And this can be inhibited by thrombosed blood. And so this then leads us to our point that when you have a high clinical index of suspicion for an aneurysmal compression causing a cranial nerve 3 palsy, perhaps it is prudent not only to just order the neuroimaging, but personally discuss with and engage with the neuroradiology team and emphasize your clinical suspicion such that when they're reviewing the image, they are more focused and directed. So our final diagnosis was a patient with the left small posterior communicating artery aneurysm, which on the catheter angiography during her endovascular coiling revealed a maximal diameter of only 3.45 millimeters that had initially ruptured extensively into the subdural space. And this then allowed for her very long-standing ambulatory period whilst this rupture had already occurred. So our patient currently post um, endovascular coiling and many months later is doing really well with complete um, or almost complete recovery of her left third nerve palsy and more importantly has no systemic neurological fallout. So the take home message, well judging from this COVID era um, and this was a pre-COVID era um, picture is that we obviously will avoid this and continue to obviously um, very responsibly socially and physical distance ourselves but related to this talk is that very often in medicine, we're very well trained to know what to look for based on our clinical assessment. And just as we know to look for the red and white stripes on as to where's Waldo, we know when faced with a especially pupil involved cranial nerve three palsy to look for and exclude the presence of a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. However, sometimes in medicine, we're faced with this when sometimes even the very well-trained eye is at a loss, even though they're quite used to seeing and looking at black and white matter. And it's during these clinical cases when the clinical findings don't correlate with the investigation findings that we always need to remember to rethink the approach, reevaluate and review the previous neuroimaging, especially get in touch with the radiologists. And perhaps even when there is a higher index of clinical suspicion, consider reinvestigation, and then also remember finally, like with our current knowledge of the matter of our very being, that there is always something more to learn. Thank you. Thanks, Trish. And uh, we're really took up all the times that we had. And um, remember, we've traveled together from the nucleus, from the, from the stem, from that building, downtown Toronto, we then travel through this long corridor, the fascicles. We left the brain stem to enter the DVP to the, fa to the cisternal space where we're surrounded by other structures, specifically by the CSF and whatever else is in the CSF. And then we've traveled all the way to our exit from the DVP, that cavernous exit where we've met um, our neighbors from work that always take the same exit because we live in the same space. And uh, we presented you three cases, one with a nuclear third nerve palsy, one with a facet with a cisternal third nerve palsy, and lastly, the one where the nerve palsy was caused by an unreasonable compression as the third nerve entering the cavernous sinus. So um, we want to leave you with that. Uh, the cases were quite exotic. The take home message is the same, that if you're encountering a patient with, a, with an acute third nerve palsy, they have to have an urgent CTA. CTA has an excellent ability to pick up small aneurysm and should pick up anything that's three millimeters or more. The biggest variable is um, an expertise of interpreting radiologists, neuroradiologists, 
And uh, we want to highlight that in the case that uh, Dr. Ajiva Patel just presented to you, the CTA was interpreted by a quaternary center mm -hmm. neuroradiologist who is actually an interventional neuroradiologist who does coiling of uh, aneurysm, and it still can be missed. So uh, it can be difficult to find. So that's our take home message. And uh, please uh, ask us any questions you might have. So Ed, there is a question that you sort of have addressed it, but uh, I want to bring it up for the, the whole audience. And there's a question from Nancy Epstein um, asking, aren't subdural hematomas often asymptomatic? And I guess she's sort of getting at the, the pain component. Right. Well, Nancy, they're that. usually are symptomatic, except here you can imagine you've got the arterial blood and the blood in the arteries is under very high pressure. And uh, kind of a really good way I think about it is whenever we do a temporal artery biopsy, I don't know whoever have, has done one, if you ever puncture the artery, and this is a tiny little artery, the temporal artery, the neuro, neurosurgeons don't even pay attention to it, they just cauterize it. But if you, if you, if you touch uh, if you touch that artery, the bleeding is such that, and we've done it before, that the, the blood hits the ceiling. So that the blood in the arterial system is under high pressure. So once you imagine this is a very different scenario, you can get um, a subdural hemorrhage from different sources, and usually it's from the, from the rapture of the bridging vein um, that are running in the subdural space, which is very different here, where you've got arterialized blood under high pressure entering the subdural space and filling it. That's why you saw the radiologist was confused. He thought it was subdural thickening rather than subdural blood. And Dura does have um, trigeminal innervation, therefore it creates pain as well. I hope that answers that. Any other questions? What about the case? Let's see, somebody asked a question about the case made you, what made us rule out Miller Fisher? Well, excellent question. First of all, what really made us roll that out is we were able to localize, we know how to examine the eye movement. So we were able to say, this is definitely third nerve palsy, as you saw from the picture, that eye could look, look only, it could only AB duct and could not do anything else. And he's got bilateral ptosis. So we were able to localize it from the clinical exam to bilateral third nerve palsies. And then of course, everything else made sense. Um, and um, um, therefore we proceeded with neuroimaging, which gave us an answer. So, but the idea here was to do to do motility exam and um, to um, to be able to interpret your findings. Um, anybody else has any questions, or maybe any other neuro ophthalmologist in attendance have any comments to any of us? I saw there's Len Levine, Vivek Patel. There's other people here. Sorry, just say the question again. I, I looked away for a second. No, I just said if anybody wants to comment on anything, no questions, but if you have any comments. On the well, cases. I'll just say it's amazing cases. They're fantastic. Absolutely incredible. And uh, really, really well presented presentation. by the residents. Yeah, everyone did a great job. Thank you, everybody. And I have to say, sometimes we go for like, you know, months and not seeing third nerve palsy, but we've had a, two months where we've had a third nerve palsy patient, I think every other day. So that's where we're, that's how the idea came for those rounds. Um, any, okay, uh, there, there is a question for um, about the third case, so either Trishal or, or Ed. Uh, Dr. Ostreicher is asking what the clinical course was for the last patient, so I don't know if there's any so update on that patient. Jamie, thanks for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Uh, this lady has done amazingly well. So with this, we've met her on the Thursday. Um, she got a CTA on the Thursday, a little bit later that day. Um, that's when we were, when we got the CTA, thinking that it, it must have been inflammatory etiology, uh, making us order a CT body for the next day, which is received in the morning. And once that was negative, we proceeded with an MRI. And so by the, um, to make a long story short, by approximately midday on Friday, we were able to localize the aneurysm. And I have to tell you uh, that uh, we had to go ourselves to the neuroradiologist who we thought was uh, the best, he is the best. And uh, it took him approximately at least 35 minutes of looking through old images to find the aneurysm, it was really not easy. And as soon as we found the aneurysm, um, it was a whole big to do. We had to transfer the patient from Mount Sinai to Toronto Western, what to call critical because we couldn't just put on the ambulance, it was a whole big production. And so she got um, a digital subtraction and geography later that day and it was coiled. And when we saw her literally a month later, um, she really was 
almost orthophoric and had zero neurological deficits. So she has done very well, uh, really luckily for her because the, if the aneurysm had ruptured and it ruptured a little while ago, had ruptured into the subarachnoid space, she wouldn't have made it. Um, that's for sure. Okay, thank you. So I wanna thank Ed and Trisha and um, Mike and Ellie, as well as Radha and Myrna who spoke earlier and a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, all of these grand rounds will be uh, posted on the DOVS website and can be accessed there. The previous rounds are already posted. So if someone missed a round that they wanna catch up on, you can do that. Next week's rounds um, by popular demand are, are once again on COVID. And we will have Abdu Sharkawi, who is the infectious diseases doctor from UHN coming back by popular demand, as well as Brant Slomovic, who is a frontline emergency room doctor uh, at UHN as well. So uh, I invite you all back for that next week. I want to once again thank our speakers and I'll hand it off to John uh, for any final words. So Ed, I remember you were quite disappointed when COVID canceled your planned rounds That's and right. now I can certainly understand <laughs> why. Uh, so congratulations to you and your team. I think everybody in the audience has been resounding in their uh, support of fantastic presentations. And look at it this way. Now you've got a much wider audience for all the hard work you did on these cases. So thank you all. Well, I have to say that uh, the resident and Trish have done, the Ellie and Mike has done a tremendous job. Uh, and first of all, learning themselves through these cases, they've done a lot of work. You had, this is a complicated stuff and they had to do a lot of reading to make sure they really understand what's going on with these cases. So thank you all for listening. All right, have a safe right. weekend, everyone. Thanks.